we want to welcome our friend or um, visitors here, Bill and uh, Janice. 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 All right, good to have you in the class. We're actually in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation right now, before we are. But we've got uh, Brother Ark here from North Dakota. He's one of our class members, but he's uh, kind of a missionary up there and working in North Dakota, but a missionary in North Dakota. And how are you doing, Brother Ark? Doing fine, thank you. H how is the the how are, how is your outreach there? Um, I've already taught a class. Come here, come up here, come here. I can't see you. Uh, you are on camera. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've already taught a class on sharing Jesus Christ without fear at a church. I'm in the process of uh, another church taking me in to do the same thing. We're trying to I'm trying to put together a team to go out there and and uh, visit the uh, uh, the people of North Dakota. Five years ago, North Dakota was just a small little community of 500. Right now, it's about 20,000 people. They expect it to grow about another 30,000 within the next, you know, five years. Um, there's no housing for nobody. So all what they're doing now, these major companies are going in there, and they're putting up man camps, what they are. They're just like huge, massive uh, land of FEMA trailers. That's where the guys live at. And the buses pull in there, and they load these guys up, and they take them to the rigs, the oil sites. So we're praying that um, we can get a team together to go out there and start hitting these man camps and uh, hopefully pray with them, present the gospel, and uh, let the Lord take over and see if we can start getting them to come to church. Uh, just keep us in prayer. It's, it's really exciting. Uh, right now the weather's really nice, but in the wintertime we get 60 below and uh, it gets cold. It's a whole different world over there when it gets cold. So thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, brother Ken Blimp. Was in our class for six years. Six years in Alma. Now he's a uh, a missionary pastor in Utah. Hey, come up here, brother. <laughs> All right. <coughs> Got to take time for you guys today. Alma, you want to come up here with him? Oh no. <laughs> so just talk about what we're doing. Yes. Um, well, we're in Magna, Utah, which is about 20 miles west of Salt Lake, little bedroom community for the, for the, for Salt Lake. Um, we have a uh, house church meeting in our house. We've got three classes that we're doing right now. We're doing Sundays, Wednesdays, um, and Mondays. We're going to start another Monday class. So we're going to have alternating. We do it every other Monday. So we're going to have two classes every other Monday, which means we're going to be in class every Monday. So we, um, we're, uh, we just got done with Revelation, mm -hmm. which we loved. Um, we're in, let's see, Romans. Well, we finished Romans. We're in Philippians, and we're in Hebrews. So we're really having, happy with that. And the big thing that we're doing, the two Monday classes, um, basic Bible theology. And we're talking about five things that, that are so very important for the people of Utah. Um, who is the true God? Who, who is Jesus? Who, who he really is from the Bible? Who is the Holy Spirit? What is man and what is salvation? So we're going to hit those five topics that are, um, and if you know anything about Mormon theology, they're com they're absolutely polar opposites from biblical Christianity. So it's it's quite a thing f to learn that everything is counter to the Bible. That it's you the hardest conversions in the world. Absolutely. So uh, we're still plugging away, enjoying life there, much cooler. <laughs> not as that, not as cold as that. But so we're happy for that. So we're we're right there in the between. We're not hot. We're not very cold. We're right in the between, right where we need to be. So yeah, brother Ken. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Would you lead us in prayer this morning now while you're up here? And and well, let's. Do you have any questions? Connor. Oh. Now Connor and um, and Paula and. and and Ellie likes to call her Shauna all the time, but we don't know why she called her Shauna. But but Paula and Connor will come in. Connor is going into uh, to be a sophomore, and they've been coming and they've been learning. And she grew up LDS, uh, not strong LDS, but if you if you knew LDS people, most of them don't know what they believe. So it, she's very very normal, um, and she's learning more about who God is. She's learning about uh, last week we talked about the Trinity. So it's been really good for her to understand what's going on and see biblical evidence for it, not just what they're hearing from um, 
from all the sources. We're on our way here, and Paul, Paula calls us. And she's so happy because she knows we're on the road, and she's just really happy. She goes, I called you. i got I got to tell you guys what Connor did today. And um, Connor, I mean, he's, he's going to go into the, 12, into the 10th grade, and he was invited to by a, by a young lady to go to some LDS group. And usually that's basically all the groups they have there is LDS groups. Uh, just to give you an idea, the evangelical presence in Utah and Idaho, who would guess how, what the percentage would be? Five, five maybe. Anything different than that? Five to ten percent. One point seven percent. One point seven percent. One point seven percent is the evangelical presence, and that's not just talking. That's talking all denominations that we would consider evangelical, not just Southern Baptist, Baptist, whatever. One point seven evangelical for the entire two states of Utah and Idaho. So it's pretty cool when something happens. So she called in. Uh, wanted to tell us what Connor did. Connor was invited by a young Mormon lady to go to one of the Mormon activities, and and uh, something came up how where he was going to tell them what we've been ta talking about about there's a difference, and that's huge. And and um, for Mormons, they do not want to know the differences. They want to believe that they're Christians just like you. They don't want to think that you believe anything different than they do, except for they just have more. And, and they take a lot of comfort in that. And anytime you poke at that, they get really mad. So that's why we're doing this Monday night thing about what's the difference between LDS theology and biblical theology, because their theology does not come from the from the Bible. So that's why we don't call it biblical theology. And he goes, "Well, we don't believe in the same God." And that really, for a young Mormon girl, that doesn't make sense. God is God, right? Well, then he went to explain why. You think about it, this is a, a sophomore boy and a girl just invited him to go out. This doesn't make sense for, his 12 year, uh, for a uh, sophomore boy because of the girl. And you know, sophomore boys, sophomore girls, you know, there's nothing going on up there. <laughs> um, but this kid, he's really smart. He says, we don't believe in the same God and that, that's completely surprised her, probably made her maybe a little angry. And he goes, you believe that God's our brother, or you believe that Jesus is our brother, and they do. They believe in a physical, literal, biological brother. And she goes, and he goes, I believe Jesus is my God. And that's huge. That's absolutely huge for him to be able to come out and say that and then to back it up. So we're really happy that we're making inroads in in this life and in the, in the other lives that we're able to um, help out. So you have it. I mean, you can get to some young people, possibly, that are confused and don't really know it, but it'd be pretty hard to get a no adult to ever listened and responded to the gospel, probably yet no confirmed Mormon, right? All of, all of the people we have coming used to be Mormon. They used to be. They were. Yeah. Former Mormon. Former, yeah. Um, you had one, the last time you were here, you had had one confirmed Mormon convert. Yeah, we had, um, we had, uh, gosh, some girl. She, she took off. Uh, she didn't really take off. She's kind of, she's in that young teenage girl thing. So, you know, um, hey, I was the same way. <laughs> and, um, but except for the girl part. The same. They don't. Yeah, they're all filled with ex-Mormons. That's all you get. There's, and 40 years ago, they would have nothing to do with us. Absolutely nothing to do with us. Today, they don't want anybody pointing out the differences. Because they want, they want us to believe, they want everyone to believe that they're absolutely the same. They just know more. You know, we have the Bible, but we have the Bible plus. And that makes all the difference. And that gets you to the third heaven. That makes, that allows you to be, to become a god someday, that allows you to get your own world, that allows you to have multiple wives, and, all, and it allows you to have all these children to populate your own world, which a lot of them don't understand because they're never taught. They're, 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 their people are very, very, oh, what do you say it? They're just, they don't know what they believe. They, the vast majority, it seems like, of Mormons are social Mormons. They don't understand what the doctrine is. Yeah. Yeah. 
life. You can lose jobs. You can lose family. Uh, more so in the past, less so now. Um, the number one religion in Utah is Mormonism. The number two religion in Utah is nothing. Atheism. That is the number two religion in Utah because in LDS, if they were told, they were told that the only true church is the LDS church, and if they get this, you know, disaffected with the uh, LDS church, they have nowhere else to go, right? Because their whole their entire life, they are told that no one else is good. So they they leave the church. They have no one nowhere to go because we we can get really good at getting them out of the LDS church, but once we get them out of it, we got to put them somewhere, or they become atheists. And that's the hard part, is getting them to trust in somebody else again. Because they've been told their entire time, it's only this, it's only this. And then when they find out something, which is some people, who likes the internet? Nobody? <laughs> um, I do, all my work is on the internet. Uh, everything I do is on the internet. So I love it. I'm, anything that's shiny and new and technology, I want it, you know. Um, but the thing is, with Utah, with the with more people on the internet, more people on high-speed internet, the access to Google, the access to different information on the internet, Mormons are realizing they've been lied to their entire lives. And now the LDS churches are coming. The don't think of each individual church like there's one right down here. It's not independent. It's not like Baptist where each in church is independent. Each church sends their money every night to Salt Lake. Every Sunday night, everything goes to Salt Lake. So it's, it's, think of the LDS church as one giant church and a bunch of satellites. So don't think of that as individual. If they say they don't pay their pastor, but they pay their, their quorum of 70, they, their, their counselors, and then the prophet. The prophet basically is the, is the uh, pastor of the entire church of the world. So where are we going? I'm sorry, I'm taking up your time. You know, it, it, it makes it really hard, very hard, for people to really, you know, those who are yearning for, for Christ, you know, for God, to, and, and everything, but because of everything going around, so here and there and here and there, it makes it so hard for someone to really convert in, in, into the truth. The yeah. They, the th sad thing is, they think they know it. We, um, we were talking about Revelation. We just, um, I taught Revelation as Jesus' coming out party. You know, you have a quinceanera or you have a sweet 16 party, right? We, we looked at Revelation of, as, as Jesus' coming out party. The very first uh, chapter of Revelation, Jesus says he is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, comma, the Almighty. He called himself Elohim. Yeah, you go. You keep on going to later on, like the 17th or 18th verse. He says he's God again. So it's kind of like God. God has sons of humor, and and, uh, and we wouldn't have one if he didn't have one. And it's kind of like he's saying, you know that Jesus you think you know, you you think you know this Jesus that walked around you for a little bit. Let me show you who he is, right? He takes the top off and he lets you see who he is. Right off the bat, he's God. And that is completely different from what the LDS believe. They don't want to know that. He's your brother. Absolutely. Um, they believe in a, in a biological sex brother. That's what they believe. Uh, same way as Satan. They won't say that because that gets them in a lot of trouble. And if you remember uh, the last, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? Romney. That came out, and the church lied about it. They said they don't believe it, and they lied. Um, one of their previous bishops got on Larry King and lied to the world about polygamy. So they believe in lying in order to protect the church, and they call it lying for the Lord. Um, more, Muslims do the same thing. As long as if you're an infidel, I can lie to you all you want. It's not bad. <laughs> when, when you get people coming into your church, is there any one reason or some main reason why they drop out of the LD, LDS? It's not it's not much different than it is here. Some of it is, um, uh, and we we want to point at them LDS, but we have the same problems. 
in our own minds, we have a wrong vision of who Jesus really is. We have a vision that Jesus is a warm, fuzzy teddy bear that we can hold him and stroke him and go, oh, but if we don't need him, we just put him away. I mean, right? I mean, we have a wrong vision of Jesus right there. So we're no different than them. It's just they, but there's this, there's real, the more you understand Mormonism, the more you realize it's demonic. It's just polar, absolute polar opposites of who Jesus is. Um, but when they're coming out, a lot of it is the, it hit the, hit the um, internet. They're learning the history of the church, and they're learning that they were lied to about the history of the church. They're learning that Jesus, that uh, Joseph Smith did not translate the tr the um, the uh, golden the golden tablets. If you see a picture in the in the Book of Mormon or anything else, you see him there studying, and well, they realize that they that Joseph Smith had a hat, right? Not too much dissimilar to this. And then what he he said he had the umum and the thurman. He put him in the hat and put his face in the hat, and that's how he translated the Bible, the, Bible, the uh, Book of Mormon. When LDS realize, they find out for the first time they hear that, they go, that's a lie. You're listening to anti-Mormon literature. And then they go to LDS.org, and they've been putting out these essays to try to curb all these problems. They admit that that's how he did it. And they're like, dang. They've been lied to their entire life. They've been showing this picture of Joe Smith very studiously translating, and now his face is inside of a hat. And they leave. Mormon doctrine, they leave about Mormon doctrine when they learn about the different things. That's why it's so important for us to differentiate between what biblical theology is and Mormon theology, and then they understand that, wait a minute, there's a difference? If there's a difference, one, both of them can't be right, right? If, both, if there is a difference and both of them call Christian, then one of them isn't, and that causes a lot of problems too. So those are the big ones, and they also they have um, falling outs, a lot of our, a uh, couple of our ladies, they they left because they they were treated terribly. The LDS Church um, will tell married people to get divorced if one leaves the LDS, if one leaves the church. So you hear about them talking about family first on TV all the time, but if if you left the LDS Church, they'd go to her and tell you to, tell her to leave you. A woman, you know, one thing that they bring out: a woman has no soul in the LDS. Only her husband can take her to heaven. Yeah. And if she doesn't have an LDS husband, she can't get to heaven. She's not going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, when you go through the temple, you'll be given a special name for her. Only you know, and hopefully you you remember it, um, that you will call her out of the grave to go to heaven. And God forbid she peeve you off and you decide to leave her. Uh, you see, they put all the they put all the power into the man's hands and they run everything. Same as this one. Mm -hmm. no, the, any persecution or anything so far? Um, no, not really. Uh, Mormons will never come to our door to visit. But see, where you guys would think that's awesome, for me I'm like, aww. <laughs> um, we... We had two visits when we were in Tooele, which is about 30 miles or 20 miles to the even further west than we were now. And then when we moved into Magna, which is right outside of Salt Lake, no one visited. And I saw it. I'm serious. People at my church, they laugh at me. There was a big blue X on my, on my driveway. Big blue X on my driveway, driveway, like a chalk. And you see the sister missionaries go to this church, go to this house. Go around ours to the next one. I'm serious. I'm, I think the blue X's stay away from them. <laughs> and um, But they know what we're doing there. We do things. I mean, there wasn't a church in Magna doing an Easter thing on for like Easter egg hunt or anything, so we decided to do it ourselves. And and uh, first year we had about 200. Next year we had about 400. So just little things like that. But we don't get really pushed around very much. So we're in, we're in a house, so it's maybe it's a little more difficult for them to find us. But oh yeah, absolutely. Avenging angels. Yeah, the Danites. The Danites were like the secret service for the for uh, Brigham Young, and they would kill people. If you let the Mormon Church their graves, they would send two mm -hmm. two angels of death out there, 
you had to dig your own grave, and then they would cut your throat and disembowel you. The, 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 the reason behind that was, Joe, was Brigham Young. Brigham Young taught the, uh, the doctrine of, of uh, blood atonement. So if, if you were, if we were all Mormon, you and me, buddy, we're, we're good Mormons, he's just a bad one, and you left the church, we would take you out, and exactly what we'd do, we'd cut you ear to ear and bury you, and that bloodletting would allow you to go to heaven still. And you'd have Isn't that to crazy? Grave. Yeah. They, when they showed up, you just started digging your grave. Yeah. So. That happened thousands of times. Yeah, the mountain where we're at, the other side of that mountain is where they take them and, and do that. And it's history, and everyone knows it, and you can be digging in your backyard and find somebody. So, it's just nuts. Um, they had the Mormon massacre down in southern Utah that was just, and people were just now finding out about that, one of the historical events. Mountain Mesa massacre. Mm hmm. Yeah. They had, um, and they blamed it on the Indians. Yeah. And then they went out and tried to wipe out all the Indians. So, that was a Brigham, that was a Brigham Young thing. Um, they don't like to listen or believe in or talk about Brigham Young because he did a lot of weird things. So, anything else? I'm taking all your time. I'm sorry. Yeah, they they don't want to talk about Brigham Young as pre, as a pre, as a as a um, prophet. They believe in continued revelation, which we don't. The problem with continued revelation is it, is God can change every, at any moment. He can change. He could say, well, polygamy is required for salvation, which he did in Brigham Young, and then say, no, it's not necessary anymore. And then he can change his mind all the time. And we know this from James 1:17. Yeah. There is no shadow of change in God. He doesn't change his he doesn't change his mind like he was a man. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we can have confidence in that. They don't have confidence. If you ask somebody, you going to heaven, they go, I hope. Maybe. But why don't you? If you're the true church, why don't you know you're going? So, and when you're talking to a Mormon, realize that they've redefined absolutely everything, so that they can say that they believe the same thing you do. Huh? Have you ever tried to sneak into the temple? I mean, there oh no, they have people there. Oh, it's just they've got they've got um, Temple Square is an actual square, and it's got gates to go in, and there's people at each gate, so you can go in and visit, but you're not going to get anywhere near that temple. They've had people sneak in. If you go on YouTube, there's videos of people walking through there with a the camera that was hidden, and you can watch the entire ceremony. That just freaks them out. So what, what's the name on that one? Do you remember that one? It was an actual member that brought a camera in there and videotaped the entire thing. So, any other questions? The biggest thing to remember is they're not Christian. They're not the same. Don't if they say we're just the same, we just know more. No, you're not. Um, when we finished up Sunday night, we we mentioned the verse where. Um, the man is standing in front of Jesus and said, Lord, Lord, haven't I done this, 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 this for you? And, that, and this is, it could be anybody, but in our area it's the Mormon man. It's the Mormon lady. Didn't I go on a mission for you? Didn't I go to the temple for you? Didn't I get all my endowments for you? Wasn't I sealed to my wife and all my children from time and eternity for you? Didn't I put on my black suit and tie every morning and go? Didn't I do a later in life mission with my wife? Didn't I do that for you? And Jesus is going to go, I'm sorry, I've never known you. And, and it's absolutely true because they're believing that Jesus is fix it. That's fictitious. They don't believe in a real powerful Jesus that has been that has lived for eternity. They believe in someone who was created at one time. They believe in a God that was created at one time. They believe in a God that was created that was a sinner just like you and I. They don't think about that. But if they believe that God was once a man like you and I, I'm a sinner. I guess he was too. The Da Vinci Code when it came out, that was really backing for the Mormon church. Because they really believe that Mary Magdalene was married. married. Well, Jesus had several wives. Yeah. But Joseph Smith is a descendant of Jesus Christ. I, I wouldn't doubt that they'd believe that at all. They, 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 a lot of them don't even realize it. They put him on such a high pedestal, they don't even realize he had a bunch of um, wives. And they just don't. It, it never dawns on them that he had anybody but Emma. So, and they don't even realize that his his wife and his mom and his son left the LDS church after he died to form the RLDS. 
so that they don't they don't really think through their so be people thinking so if you're here if you heard something I know he said this before be a Brian don't take I don't I don't let anybody take my word for it check it out against the Bible and then do it because Mormons don't we've gone to a couple we went to one service it wasn't really called a service it was a meeting they call them and they don't crack the Bible open at all and the only time you'll hear Jesus is when they pray when they think they're praying to him in Jesus name that's the only time you'll hear Jesus all the old literature is gone isn't it uh, the pearls of great price and all other writings that's all there but it's been cleaned up um you have to go you have to get literature that was printed before 1920 to get it in its own almost original form after that they sanitize all the history they sanitize the, the doctrines and covenants this is one of their main books that they use they actually took out the doctrines and now they just have the covenants in there but they still call it the doctrine and covenants so you have to go pre-1920 to find anything of their of their normal stuff and if you bring it off if you bring it up to them cut it off they're not talking to you anymore because they're told to fear that so the whole the whole thing is designed for them never to be saved so um, anything else yeah um, you know what I've learned through this study, I'm sorry Jim um, I like to do, do a lot of searching yeah and uh, and there's a word that I don't understand so I always have my uh, um, dictionary absolutely yeah. so but what I really really love is that when when you get close to God in prayer or by yourself you know and, and if you ask him for that discernment with so many things you know he can give you all that he can give you discernment on so many things he will teach you absolutely but then you just get really close to him you know they believe that they will say I completely believe you but they believe it different than, he, than you believe it exactly. they'll say if anyone lacks knowledge what are you supposed to do ask but that's it that's where they stop they don't care about reading scripture they don't read about doing all the other things the Bible also says how are they supposed to hear unless they're taught and where are they taught the top the scripture but they pull that that one verse out of context and say if anyone lacks wisdom pray and that's how they say okay if you want to know that the Book of Mormon is real pray about it don't read it don't think about it don't check it out against the Bible just pray about it and if you feel good I mean they're the ultimate Nike brand if it feels good do it I'm serious if if you confront them with something that's wrong they feel bad they're taught that that's of the devil and then they get rid of it how are we saved how are we saved conviction conviction doesn't feel good does it they will automatically believe that that's of the devil and throw it away that's why I say this thing is demonic because what they're doing is saying that thing that's making you feel bad that's the devil when reality we know it's the Holy Spirit trying to get you to turn right and that's what it is of the devil absolutely it is sad because they're wonderful awesome we have great friends that are LDS and they're just oblivious to reality that's why we need to pray for them because because I'm not going to crack that egg it, only God's going to get in there all I can do is be there so um, let me, but Jim was asking for this too this is my number to get me in Utah uh, during the day I'm probably working but um, a, a resource if you want to look at more at Utah Lighthouse Ministries dot org um, Sandra Tanner she's like the number one on the hit list for the LDS Church she puts out a lot of stuff on their web page if you want to learn more and uh, it's amazing the things that they used to believe that they no longer do and no one knows understands it that's not you right? this is not me this is this is Sandra Tanner what was the other end that was with her Gerald. Gerald passed away yeah. they wrote a 10, book 15 this years day. ago. They got a book as big as the Shadow and Reality. Yeah. They have they have a uh, they have a store right across from the baseball. Oh, yeah. Mormon Research Ministries. 
That is excellent. That has um, this is a podcast, and you can listen to it. They do about fifteen minute segments, so it's little, it's information really quick, and um, so that's really good to listen to that as well to add it to your already listening load. Any other questions, comments, concerns? No. All right, these are great resources. We're then we're also here to ask any questions, answer any questions you may have. Brother Ken, thank you very much. I, I, we have two missionaries here today that came out of our class, and Brother Ken's been out there, and, and it's a rough field, a very hard field to, uh, uh, you know, the problem with Mormonism, th their God is not the same, and when they think about God, it's not the God you're talking about, and boy, to get them saved, they got to come to the knowledge of God. Now, it, it's worse than going into... South America, out there where people never heard about God, supposedly, because they believe in God, okay? But they're not as messed up. Those wild people down in South America and Africa or wherever, they've never seen human beings. They're not as bad a shape as these Mormons that have been taught from the cradle that God is them. And, and if you're a male, you can become a God, just like him. That's hard. Yeah. Yet, uh, well, thank you all that were at the wedding yesterday. My daughter Dakota got married, and we did. Uh, uh, you just did fantastic, getting everything ready. Uh, a lot of people are gone on summer here, and uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself here for just a minute. We got some new people in here. I'm uh, Jim Phillips. I uh, I teach Greek and Hebrew in this church. I think we've sent more missionaries out of our classes than we have than any church in, at Valley Baptist Church. This is the one where I train the preachers and train the missionaries. This is where you get stuck in God's Word. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, yeah. And this little fellow right here now, now he's our song leader, but he's preaching this morning. Yeah. <laughs> you know what God's doing, that man? <laughs> you got any idea? <laughs> if he's not called to preach, I'll eat my hat, and I don't want to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to go. He's going to go work with the Korean church right now. So he's here in the beginning. Uh, we have discovertheword.com, which is back up again, by the way. We've got. Uh, Discover the Word with Dr. Jim .com, which has hundreds and hundreds of videos on both of those. Uh, our class, you'll see Brother Ken in there, Alma, uh, when they were young, and me when I was a little younger. Some of those classes go back 40 years. Not the videos. Well, I do have one video that goes back 40 years. But uh, anyway, you can hear me preach 40 years ago, from uh, 1970 on. And uh, all the different classes we've taught the doctrines of the Bible in my class so many times. Ken and, and Alma were in my class here. They were in all of my Greek classes and all the Hebrew classes. And when you went back to Louisville, Kentucky, they taught you baby Greek. <laughs> <laughs> we teach advanced reading and research in my classes. And Hebrew, this afternoon at 4.30, I'll be teaching the book of Exodus from Hebrew. But don't be afraid of any Greek and Hebrew at all, because I'm teaching you the Bible. You just learned in a little bit of Greek and Hebrew with it. Go to the Revelation, the, the, the book of Revelation, the 12th chapter. Revelation chapter 12. By the way, I've said this two or three times. There's one of the best commentaries besides mine. This is mine. This was my doctor's thesis. <laughs> my doctor of Bible languages thesis. Anyway, uh, by the way, I just applied for my third one with the book of, Exodus, uh, with the book of Genesis. Uh, the Revelation of Jesus Christ, a commentary by John Wolbert. This is very, very good. He gives you all the different theories of it. Of course, in my interlinear, it's an interlinear and, and commentary also. Uh, I do basically the same thing in it. We've studied the different theories of Revelation, um, you know, of, of the interpretation of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. Thank you for the missionaries that were here this morning, how that they're taking what they've learned in these classes and from your word and going out and sharing it with people in the world. Some of them are just pagans and some of them are atheists. And Father, be with me today. Be with my daughter on her honeymoon in Pismo Beach. Keep them safe. And my other son in Fort Lewis, 
on our way back to Fort Lewis, Washington, and my other boys and my grandchildren. I pray that you lead all of them to you, to a, a deep and, and committed relationship with you for the rest of their lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Revelation 12 and 1. This is a parenthetical chapter again. We have a parenthetical chapter. We have things rolling along in the book of Revelation. The Revelation, by the way, I like what you said there, Brother Ken, a while ago about the book of Revelation. It's the Apocalypse Jesus Christ. All right, that's what it is. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And over and over again, John, all of John's writing, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation, all pictures Jesus Christ as the Logos. All right, the Logos. That's the word Logos. But it comes from this word in Hebrew. That word. What is that word there, Brother Roger? Hadavar. That means the word. If you take Colin DeLeash in the commentary in the first, first volume there, when you look at the word Logos, when it comes in the New Testament to Logos, what John is saying, he's using a Hebraism. It is not a Greek idea. Logos is not a Greek idea of theos or God. We got a word theology from theos, okay? But um, Logos is Jehovah. Now, let's go back to John 1 and 1. In beginning, kept on being the Jehovah. Not talking about the Word, and the Jehovah kept on being an inseparable part of the Godhead because he, Jehovah kept on being God. John 1.14 says, Tihologo Sarxagenito, and the Word, the Jehovah, flesh he became. And it's a whole lot different than what we're talking about in Mormonism. God became flesh one time. One time. Hapox, it says in the original language. Once for all, Jesus Christ became flesh. He was the eternal God that created everything. Colossians, the first chapter. And in Revelation, the first chapter, Revelation 19th chapter is so beautiful. We haven't got there yet. But let's turn there for just a minute because this is a parenthetical thing. Let's go to Revelation, the 19th chapter, really quick. Because it's full. John's writings are full of Hebraism. Matter of fact, the book of Revelation is so full of Hebraism that many Greek scholars would not accept it at all because there's too many mistakes in it too many grammatical mistakes but it's not grammatical mistakes it is Hebraism all right Revelation the 19th chapter go on down to uh, verse number 11 and I saw in heaven opened up and a, uh, a Luca hippos a white horse we get the word leukemia from that word for white in, in Greek. White blood cells, leukemia. A white horse, and he who sat upon him called faithful, true, righteousness, and he judges and wages war. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems. Now a crown is a crown, but a diadem is a diadem. What's a diadem? It is a banner that comes off the crown. You have the crown by right of by right of uh, uh, of ancestry or whatever, and then the diadem is what you conquer. Okay. Now he has a crown on his head, a diadem, and his name is written upon it, and no one knows except himself. Look at that now. In the in after Israel received the word of God from Moses by the hand of Moses, it says, "Thou shalt not use what." The Lord thy God's name in vain. Now, here is the word for the name of God. That is it right here. That is the word. We have the word here, Jehovah. We cannot say that word. We don't know how to say that word. It's impossible to say that word. Okay? We don't know how to say it. These are all consonants. And you can't say a word in Hebrew unless you know what the vowels are. They didn't have vowels, but they would did not. They quit speaking this name, so they would refer to him as Hadavar, the word, when they come to it. Now Elohim, we can say that. You can say Adonai, but you better not say this word if you're a Hebrew, because that might seal your eternal destiny in hell if you use his name in vain. Now it starts with the Yod. Right here, that's a yod, and that's the sign of the hand 
in Hebrew, all right? Yod, Yod is hand, all right? Go like this. Now, if you tried to say it, it would just like you would be going, breathing out life, breathing out your breath, okay? Now, we don't know how to say this name at all because they wouldn't say it. It's an unpronounceable name. This is the personal name of God. This is like Bill, your first name. This is, this is God's first name. This is his given name. God gave himself. Now, look at here. So I'm going to show you how, this, how impossible it is to say this name. All right? Now, in Hebrew, you only have vowels. So you need something. Now, say this name, Jehovah. Jehovah. Now, let's get rid of the vowels. There you are. Say it. Can't say it. Jesus. That's easy to say, isn't it? Now, the J was a vowel also. So now let's get rid of this. Now say his name. Do you see how impossible it is to say that name? It's not possible. But that's who it is. Now, if, now the modern Jews refer to Jehovah as Adonai or Hashem, or Havavar. But John, back in those days, it was Havavar, the Word. Now let's look and see what it says here in the book of Revelation. And uh, a name that no one knows except himself. And he, and he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is Onomate. All right, onomate, it means his legal name. The word nomos has come out of that, which means law. Okay, this is your name. You have a legal name, okay? His legal name is called Hathavar. This is Hebrewism, not Greek. It's a Hebrewism. And what would we say there instead of it? The Jehovah. The Jehovah of God. What does Jehovah mean? It comes from a little old Hebrew word right here, and that is what? That's a to-be verb, and it means to become. That's what his name means. The one who shall become. That's who he is, the one who shall become. Now, he became. There are a million gods running around people. There's only one God. We know him as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but the only physical God you're ever going to see is the one that broke into space and time, which is Jesus Christ. All right? And it says, and in armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white clean, and following him on white horses. And from his mouth proceeds a sharp sword. All right? How did God create the heavens and the earth? He spoke them in existence, and they came from him. The Catholic Church, you know, they had this ex nihilo business. This ex nihilo business is not this, it's biblical. This ex nihilo business, it came from God. The book of Hebrews says that we, everything was created from things that are not seen. Everything exploded forth from God. Everything came from God. Everything that ever created, he spoke it, and then he spit it out. He held it in solution, and he spoke it, and it became crystallized in form. All right? And from his mouth comes out this short, sharp sword that he's going to smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads out the winepress of the wrath of God, the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. Here again is a Hebrewism. What's the word for Almighty God in Hebrew? El Shaddai. That's who Jesus is. He's El Shaddai. If you go to the front of the website, go to discovertheword.com or, or whatever, you can go on there and say the names of God are Jehovah titles. Jesus fulfilled every Jehovah title. El Shaddai, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his side, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This goes back in the Old Testament in many places. The book of Deuteronomy, uh, Psalm 24, 1 through 10. Um, Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Deuteronomy 10, 17. It talks about the name of God. The name of God. And here it uses another Hebraism, and it is Adonai Ha'adonaim. Adonai Ha'adonaim. Adonai means what? Brother Ken, you remember what that word means? 
That means king. King of kings and Lord of lords. Adonai Ha Adonaim. Adonai Ha is a definite article. Ha Adonaim. The king of king of Lord of all lords. The Hebraism. Go to ten go to Deuteronomy six and four real quick. Deuteronomy six and four. And ten seventeen. Deuteronomy, that means what? The second law. Deuteronomy six and four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is a polygamy of beings. What is it? What does it say there? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, Adonai, Jehovah, our God, Jehovah our Elohim, the Lord is one. Now let's go down to Deut Deuteronomy 10:17. This is Jesus that you're seeing here, and this is the only God that you will ever see in, 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 in existence. For the Lord your God is the God of gods, Adonai Ha'adonaim. Look at that. The Lord your God, Jehovah your Elohim. He is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. The great, the almighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. I'll go back to Deuteronomy. I'll go back to the book of Revelation again. And 12 and verse 1. Revelation 12 and verse 1. And I saw a great sign appeared into heaven. And a woman clothed with the sun. A woman clothed with the sun. And the moon under her feet. And on her head a crown of 12 stars. Okay? Now, go back to 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 Genesis 37 verses 9 through 11. Genesis 37, 9 through 11. Boy, I had a ball teaching the book of Genesis from Hebrew. It was, uh, I did 140 classes on that. It's out on the web internet too, Brother Ken, if you're going to do that. And I got the book, all the book of Hebrews is on there. The book of James is on there. All the books that you, Romans, everything is on there. All right. Genesis 37, 9 through 11. Now, we're talking about Joseph's dream. Joseph is the type of Christ in about 70-something different ways. Now, he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, pay attention, I have had him still another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. See what he's talking about? Who is this now? Jacob, or Joseph, that is. Joseph. Joseph. He's talking about this Joseph. All these are going to bow down to him. Jacob's going to bow down to him. And his, and his mother's going to bow down to him. Who was his mother, by the way? Rachel. Yeah, the little lamb, the little lamb. All right. And he related to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come and bow down before you to the ground and his brothers were jealous about him and about his uh, father and he kept the same but his father kept the saying in his mind and then uh, that's when they uh, are going to uh, murder him sell him off but God's unpreventable progress and his eternal purpose could not be thwarted Jehovah Roe Jehovah Roe. That little old uh, Pharaoh's daughter, actually, Hagar. It's a little girl named Hagar. Remember her? Hagar means wanderer. When Abraham went down into Egypt, Pharaoh wanted to make a political alliance with him, so he gave him a daughter, one of his daughters, by a concubine, and that was Hagar. And uh, of course, there for a while, he didn't have anything to do with her, but, you know, Sarah coaxed him into bringing forth this child. And if you realize, realize too, Abraham had three wives. Sarai, Sarah, all right, which was a Shemite. Hagar was a Hamite. And what was Keturah? A Japhethite. So if you check your DNA, you're going to go find out. You're going to go right straight back. How do you like to be directly related to Abraham? You probably are. 
<laughs> with all three of those. Do you know that Alexander the Great was a descendant of Abraham? Huh? Think about that for a while. Think about that one for a while. All right, let's go on a little bit more. Revelation. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon was under her feet, and on her head were her twelve crowns. This is talking about Israel. All right. And she was with child. Now, in Genesis 3.15, it tells us uh, that this, this was Jehovah God speaking to the devil. He's talking to the woman, Isha, and talking to Adam. Okay? And they had, uh, they had sinned, and we have uh, old Satan pulling more of his tricks and uh, talked them into sinning like he had already done. And, but he promised that the seed of the woman would overcome the seed of the devil. All right? And here we have the fulfillment of that. The seed of the woman, in the book of Enoch, it never talks about Jesus as being the seed of man or the son of man, but always the son of woman because he's looking back to Genesis, the third chapter, and verse 15. So now here we are. Now this woman, Israel, from Abraham, from Adam through Adam and through Abraham we have a child that's going to be the Messiah in Genesis the fourth chapter when Eve had the first son and that son's name was what Cain Cain or Cain and that means what brother Roger I have got I have got and uh, in Hebrew Eve said, I have gotten a man, et Jehovah. That word right here. I have gotten the Messiah. And then in that chapter we find out that this false Messiah was a murderer like the false Messiah, like the Antichristos would, the Antichrist. Okay? All right, she was with child and she cried out and being in labor and in pain to give birth. Verse number three. Now we have a uh, Eve said, "We nahashishi ani." <laughs> That's Hebrew. She said, "The snake, the snake, he gave to me. The snake, he gave to me." Now look at here. We see the snake again. We see the snake. That's a giant dragon, a leviathan. In the book of Exodus. When, when Aaron threw his rod down in Pharaoh's palace, it did not become a snake. Forget it. It wasn't a snake. What was it? Tanim, a dragon. They took this rod and they threw it down on the floor and it became a leviathan. It became a dragon. A dragon. A dracon. It is in the Septuagint is what it says. Dracon, our word dragon, comes right out of it. It became a giant dragon. And Tanin, I was up at the uh, film festival at, at um, Long Time here a year ago in October. And I was sitting there by these Jewish people. And my wife was telling this girl, she was uh, in the movies and everything else, telling this girl how smart I was in Hebrew. And so she, when I sat down there she starts asking me a bunch of questions she said well how do you how much Hebrew do you know and I said well I know a lot of Hebrew and she said what's different in the Hebrew than it is in English I said everything <laughs> you know I said just start off right with Genesis 1 and 1 and Genesis 1 and 2 and I said then go down to uh, let's go into Pharaoh's palace I said what did that rod that Pharaoh, in Pharaoh's palace that Aaron threw down, what did it become? She said, a snake. I said, what's the word for snake in Hebrew? And she said, nosh. I said, but that's not it. I said, it is tanin. And she said, look at me real funny. And she said, that means dragon. That means fire and smoke. I said, that's right. That means a fire-breathing dragon. That's a leviathan. Now, in Hebrew legend, you know, Hebrew legend has that... Uh, in the ocean that the Leviathan was the guardian of all of the depths of hell 
There was a great Leviathan in the Sea of Galilee that guarded the very gates of hell. And that's what's caused all the storms and everything out there. Now on the earth, now out in the desert, when Jesus went out in the desert and was tempted for 40 days, out there is the behemoth. That is the place, that is the place of this giant supernatural creature out there that is a boogie monster. Okay? But in the water, it was the Leviathan. Okay? Now, when he, he throws that rod down there, it becomes a Leviathan. It becomes a dragon, a powerful dragon. And then we, from the book of, of 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy, that Paul tells us the name of those two prophets that were there representing Satan and Pharaoh. What were their names? Come on. What were the names? Janus and Jambres. And where did he get that? Where did he get their names? No. From the Book of ja Jasher. Hasatar Yashur. All right? From the Book of Jasher, he got who the names were. And these are Balaam's sons. That rat, Balaam, was involved for a long time trying to thwart God's w word and his will and his people. Anyway, Janus and Jambres, they uh, threw their rods down and they became Leviathans. Not snakes. It's a lot easier to believe that the rod became a snake in it. But how about a dragon? How about if it was a real dragon, which that's what it says now. It doesn't say snake. It doesn't say Nahash. It's Tanin. All right? I threw it down and became a dragon, and God's dragon ate Satan's dragons. Now we have that great Leviathan of old. The one that embodied there in Pharaoh's palace. We have him again. And another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. And his, and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman that was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Right there, previews the coming attractions. That's where we're going to start next week. <laughs> All right, who's coming up here, Brother David? Thank you, uh, Brother Ken and Art that was here today. Uh, it's so good to have you in here and reporting to us and, and everything. We'll be here at 4.30 this afternoon. I wonder if you can come or not. But anyway, uh, Brother David, thank you for your attention today, and thank you. I know the class of joy having you here.